Okay, so my name is Maurice Dupuis. Um, just a little background. Actually, I'm an aerospace engineer, um, so I gave up the third dimension and came then back to two dimensions, which is the automotive industry. And uh, I was previously working, as I said, in aerospace, but always in the simulation department. So my background really is simulation. Um, and then in 1998, I started my own company together with some other guys. We developed formats like OpenDrive, OpenCRG, and others you will uh, see here uh, also coming up again. And uh, then I started, well, we sold our company and uh, the, the usual story, and uh, then I did a sabbatical. And then actually I started at ASAM uh, where we had transferred the, the standards I tried to get rid of. Um, so now I'm the CEO of ASAM, I'm back to the standards, and it's, it's a fun, it's really fun at these times of the industry because everything is changing, but still we need a constant, and the constant are the standards. Um, let, me, let me just try to work a little bit here uh, for you on the standards itself, what they mean and uh, yeah, what, what might need to be covered. We, we had a lot of high-level discussions today. I, I tried to start here with a high-level view, which is anyway already a little bit, um, let's say, detailed. If we look at an ADA system, it, it has somehow to tackle with the real world. You have a mapping component, uh, you have a localization component, you have infrastructure. We had quite a few good discussions today about infrastructure, and I'm looking at a specific guy here. Um, traffic, weather, environment, etc. So what you are usually trying to tackle here with the discussions we had today is to have this system under test to, to make sure it, it works. And the other thing is you're not alone. So you have the governments, uh, companies, industry association, municipalities, tier ones, research institutes, the OEMs, uh, and so on and so on. And the, the, the question is, are they all speaking the same language? Because if they do not, you will have a problem of, of getting your system uh, developed. If we look into the system, if you look into an ADAS or AD system, you have, again, the real world. You have a sense component, a detect, plan, act, execute component. And the thing is, uh, you need to communicate on these levels. So also this needs to be done mostly independent of the uh, let's say, of the tier one you're using or, or the OEM who is integrating. The other thing is we also have a virtual environment. And, I, well, we are here at a, at a simulation company, so this means the virtual part is really here the, the, the key focus. And also for this, uh, the, the question is how can I speak between the real world and how can I speak uh, between real and virtual world? Um, again, the question is, is this the same language? Can I use the same language uh, for, for both worlds? And this is where standards come into play. Standards define this language. It's about a single language, no matter what native language you have, it's about a single uh, technology language that is for everyone, every party I have named in these previous slides. And of course, in order to make sure that it's working, it has to be developed by experts. Usually there's different ways of doing it, um, you can work, do it with a committee, which is always a nice process, or you can do it in, in a grassroots environment. Uh, the grassroots means it's a de facto standard, and this is actually how some of the standards I'm talking about uh, started out. We just said, hey, here's a cool format, we give it to everyone, uh, use it, it's a de facto standard. It doesn't mean it has to be accepted, it's just a, a, st a standard that everyone has an option to use. If you go via committee, of course, then it's more formalized. Think about ISO, think about IEEE. Um, but this also means uh, if you do it on the grassroots level, the standardization, uh, you get what you get. You can accept it, you can use it, you can well, modify it, whatever you want to do. If you go with a committee, then you have someone who is accountable. And this is very important because then you have a go-to address. And my email will be at the very end of this presentation. So if you have a question about our standards, uh, just let me know. Um, so. There's also another key in standardization. The question is, is a standard open or is it closed? So can everyone access it? We, we are in the open source uh, days these days. So is, is a standard also as open as the software that implements it? Or is it, uh, which we see usually on the formal side more, is it a, a closed standard that, that comes up there? What's the value of a standard? Um, and I hope this is not boring to you, but what what is really the value? And if, if we look at the development cycle of, uh, of an automated driving system, um, there's 
I'm, I'm sorry to say this here, but there's no single tool that can do the full trick through, throughout the whole development cycle. Everyone is working on it, and, and some may even be able to do it, but if you start with model in the loop and you want to end up in hardware in the loop, these are completely different requirements that you have. So this means you may not be able to do the whole development cycle with a single tool. But what does it mean if it's not standardized? You build up data and assets with the first tool. Then you change the tool. Then you start to build again with the next tool, your data. The same scenarios, you had the same scenarios before, but you need to test it not in software, not in model in the loop, but now in software in the loop or driver in the loop. So you have to build it again and this again and again. So I think you get this. If you have standards, it's a different story. Um, if you have standards, you can keep what you develop first because if everyone is adhering to the same standards and you can reuse your data, you can reuse your scenarios, then what you do, you just keep it and then you take the next tool, but you build on top of what you have and you keep it with the next tool and the next and the next. So this is the, you, you see the difference in, in how many, how much assets you have if you stick to standards, then if you don't stick to them, if you do it by yourself or if you change the vendor, et cetera. So it's really, it, it's really pure dollars that you are having here uh, that uh, are the value of the standards. And this is why it makes a lot of sense to work in, in standardization organization uh, like ours. Talking about our organization, I try to keep it short, but you should know who ASM is. Um, we are driven by a community. I take this slide again, I go through it a little bit uh, quicker. What we are doing at ASM, and this is what you see on the, on the left side of the slide is, um, we say the, the, the experts and these, well, this grassroots environment, we just have them as members in our association and we make sure that from the members we select uh, the right people, the right experts to go into projects who will then define standards and uh, will that make make these available for everyone. And the good thing is the ones who are our members are also the users of our standards. So this means everyone has an interest to get good standards done. <clears throat> um, just a few more facts. Uh, why has ASM been founded? Um, the, one of the key reasons is that uh, no two OEMs can talk in, in a single room uh, from because of antitrust regulations. And ASAM always invites all the relevant stakeholders when it comes to agreeing on a data format or, or, or on, a, on a communication protocol. So nobody's left out. And this is why it's, it's, a, it's an excellent uh, means to agree on efficient data formats, but not to leave out anyone. Um, we are member driven. This is what I've already said. Uh, what we do at ASAM is um, we are we are giving recommendations only. We say, okay, industry, this is an offer to you. If you adapt it or not, that, that's up to you. So it's not like UN regulations or something that you have to adhere to, but uh, we let the market decide. And you see, we have been in business for 25 years now, so, so the market has decided that there is a value in what we are doing. And we work on the implementation level. So here, talking to engineers, whatever we define, you can directly take it and implement it. That's, uh, that's the, uh, the cool stuff. So there's data formats and there are uh, communication protocols. This is the portfolio. I'm not going through it in detail of for sure, and I'm not going to show a single slide on uh, for each of these uh, formats. I just want to point out what might be of interesting today, and in the, in the context here of this, uh, of this uh, meeting is, we have the simulation business, which is the, the top left, and uh, hopefully I think here the, the most important. We have things for, for data management. We heard about data collection that is going to happen. Uh, we had measurement and calibration, which also goes into data uh, collection here. Like if you, if you collect data on the road with your sensors and you want to make it uh, available then for uh, later on for analysis. And a test automation is a key thing. We, we heard about uh, automated testing that should take place, but uh, if, for example, you're running a hardware in the loop test bench and, and you change the front end or you change the back end, we have the standard that makes sure that any front end can, to, can talk to any back end so you can choose the vendor. So th this just means, um, and this was the reason why ASAM was founded by originally by OEMs. The OEMs wanted to choose from the market the best tool vendors 
for whatever purpose there is, and they were aware that they need to exchange them once in a while. And this is why we have the standards now going, and now uh, it's available for the entire industry. So just for you, a little overview of, of well, who we are. We now have, uh, well, one thing is, is to be said, we only have industry members. So each logo you see here is a company. And for each company, you know how many employees potentially there are. There's a one-man company as well as a 100,000 people company. And they all have the, the special interests that are being represented. So we have more than 440 members currently. Uh, we already added more than 30 members this year. And you see the, the OEMs, uh, the tier ones, tool vendors, and well, also a lot of research uh, activities from academia that are uh, members. How does it look on a worldwide scale? Um, in the in the US, it's it's a little bit since we have different categories, different sizes of members. I, I always like to show the members and the revenue from the members because the membership fees scale with the uh, with the size of the members. So you see that the most of the our business still is in Europe. We are trying to pick up or catch up here in the US, although we are already very strong. Uh, I have to admit. And Asia is picking up a lot. So we have a lot of growth. We had a lot of growth in China last year. Um, and th this may also be, be interesting. Usually you don't get any data out of China, but knowing that they are using our standards in China so that you as a tool vendor can, can go to China and uh, say, okay, I know how you're storing your data and I can help you with my tools to, to make better use of that, uh, that's a real value. Okay, um, yes, like, like I said, we are international, so uh, I'm, I'm typically showing up at, uh, at conferences like this one here. Uh, we have our own international conference that we usually host in Germany. We have our regional meetings. We had our regional meeting this year already in, in Japan. We had a big meeting in China this year. Uh, we had a big meeting in, in Korea at the beginning of uh, September. And the week before last week, there was the regional meeting here in the US. So we really try to cover the entire globe and to make sure that we get the requirements from everywhere. Uh, just for you, as an information, I don't have it here on the slide. We, as I said, we do our standards in projects. So we currently have like 12, 13 projects running with, uh, let me think, almost 400 participants. So individuals in, in, this, in these projects. Uh, from more than 200 companies. So you see we are very active and this means you, you find your peers, you can discuss with them about uh, any of the standards that might be relevant to your use cases. Um, these are the guys behind the scenes. We just had a strategy workshop last week, so I thought it would be a good idea to have a very fresh picture. So these are the guys driving everything, um, but uh, enough of advertising uh, for, for ASAM. The, Partnerships are very important for a standardization organization because not everyone can become a member or is a member. And of course, there are other organizations which we pretty much also recognize. You have Autosar, you have Eclipse, IMTS, ISO, and, and well, you name it, SAE here is very important. Uh, and we have partnerships agreements with, with all of them. But what's really important for us is we are also going with the research projects, the government funded research projects, which is a key thing in the European Union, at least. Um, also in Japan, there is a lot uh, like this SIP ADOS, which you see on the top right. Um, and it's very important to go to these research initiatives. And this is also the reason why we like to have academia in our members, because they are the really the early adopters. They, they want to use the standards for whatever projects they are running. Um, and, but we also need to make them aware that standards exist, because otherwise uh, students tend to reinvent the wheel if they don't just find at the first internet search the format they are looking for, they define it by themselves. And we just try to save these, um, uh, these R&D projects money by saying, hey, we are here, we can associate with you, it doesn't cost you anything, we give you all the standards that we have, uh, we explain them to you, and then you can just use them for your project. And one of the most uh, famous projects, the government funded projects you may know, is the Pegasus project in Germany, which was all about automated driving and was a couple years ago and it has split off uh, quite a lot of uh, other projects uh, meanwhile. So <clears throat> this, this is the main uh, focus around uh, the standards, why, why they are there. Um, if you look, um, now if you look a little bit at the landscape of uh, standards for, for ADAS testing, uh, it's clear that this is not a, a single 
associations business. And this is a, a slide I, I just want to explain shortly. Um, I've taken it from uh, what you see, there's a QR code. This, this is a, a guide uh, published by us for, called the SIM guide. So it's all about simulation um, and standards around simulation. If you look how these vehicles, the ADA systems are, uh, are defined, you, you, you have a specification in, in, in the test area. area. You have, uh, when it's executed, the, the system on the test, so it's all about um, testing of the vehicle, of course. You have to evaluate how it's running, you have to process, process data, and you have to store the data. So this is what's in the inner part of it. Uh, on top, you have the configuration management, and then uh, you have uh, some yeah, processing of, of logs, etc. There's a lot of standards addressing all of this, um, and in each specifically. So we have, of course, from our side, we have the uh, ASAM standards, which are here in blue. But you also see ISO is uh, telling you how to test the, the things, SAE, J3016, of course, is explaining you all the basics. Um, and uh, AutoSAR is very important, of course, because it provides you the full stack um, and it also adapts many of the standards that are defined from, from ASAM side. Um, so it's, it's important that if you see also from our side, we, we do not only look at a niche, and I've shown you the whole portfolio, we just try to make sure that uh, throughout the whole way you're developing and testing an ADAS system, uh, we can support you with our standards and we make sure that you can uh, reuse your data. Um, I, I think we can uh, hand out these slides later on so you can maybe read it a little bit better than uh, just by, by looking at the screen. Um, yeah, let me, uh, yeah, that's, I, I think it's better to go with this slide here. Um, I was talking about the reality and the digital twin before, that both need to be covered in terms of how you describe things. And if we look at the different categories that we have there now from, let's say, uh, yeah, the, the, the simulation side, um, you have the static part, you have the dynamic part of the world, you have the sensing and perception part, and you have the vehicle. So like, it's, it's like the first two slides I showed, a little bit condensed. Um, and you have the same, you have an equivalent, of course, in the digital world if you want to test. Now the question is, where do the standards come into play? The first one is that for both, for the reality and the digital twin, you have to define the operational design domain. Well, basically you define the operational design domain for your final system, and then you say, okay, this part needs to be tested with my digital twin. So we heard already today that testing is driven more by the, or the deployment is driven more by the ODD, than by uh, test requirements. So this is perfect because I, ASAM is currently working on the ASAM Open ODD uh, specification. And uh, you can still uh, uh, watch that project as it, as it is uh, coming along. Um, and this is really trying to, to define a single language how to describe the ODD so that in a machine readable format you can then test your scenarios and everything and verify it whether it runs with your ODD. Test specification, I will come back to that a little bit later on. For the static world, um, we have for the digital, mostly for the digital twin, we are describing road networks and everything with open drive and uh, road surfaces with open CRG. For the dynamic world, for the real world, as well as for the digital twin, we use open scenario. Um, for sensing and perception, we have open labels, so you can label your frame by frame or over multiple frames, over multiple sensors, your data, uh, and we have the open simulation interface which helps you to exchange data. So one or other one here in the room might have heard about these formats already. And for the vehicle and for the testing itself, there are many more formats. I'm not going to go into more detail. Yet another view on, on the whole landscape, and this is something we started like two years ago, and that's currently running as uh, open test specification, also as a project. We look in a systematic way with, with our experts, we look at the test environment, so sill, hill, mill, whatever it is, proving ground, uh, on-road test, and the test method. So do you re do requirements-based testing, interface testing, fault injections, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we try to figure out where are the white spots, what is not harmonized yet across the, the, the stakeholders, where do we need additional standardization so that the testing can become not easier but more aligned 
uh, in, in the road. As we said, again, it's, it's a collaborative effort, this, this uh, automated driving, and we need to make sure that everyone is testing in the same way so you can compare the results, uh, and the authorities will at some point uh, have a means to yeah, uh, give the approval to your system. Um, my, my presentation was about standards and regulations. I, I promise I will not talk long about regulations because this, regulations are the framework, basically, that we have. Um, we have provisions for drivers, like in 1968, we already had the Vienna Convention on Road Traffic, which is basically still kind of the basis for everyone moving around uh, in the world. Um, and this is the, the only really international part here. Then we have national regulations for the drivers. We have general regulations, and I think it was also mentioned today, like ISO 26262 and uh, others, uh, SOTIF and cybersecurity, which are highly relevant for automated driving, especially cybersecurity and, and, and SOTIF. So these are general regulations that are uh, available. And then if we come more onto the provisions for vehicles, which is important because now the vehicle has to fulfill the function, not so much the driver anymore, um, there are many uh, regulations about homologation, like the UNECE uh, rules. The latest is this A ALKS. Um, then we have from the European Union um, some regulations on automated vehicles. Um, and we have the German, what I really like. Germans are good at making abbreviations. The AFGBV, and I will read it to you. This is the Autonome Fahrzeuge Genehmigungs- und Betriebsverordnung. It's a, usually it's a single word in Germany, just here with all the hyphens in between. Um, well. I don't know whether we are better at the regulations or at giving them some titles. I don't know. We will figure it out at some point. But you have a whole set and you have other regulations. Not so much um, homologation laws here in the US, but you have a lot of things in the European Union, South America, and of course in China. And China is a big market also for, for us at ASAM, so we can bridge the gap always uh, between the continents. So there's a problem with standards. Um, especially if we say they are recommendations only. Uh, some people use the recommendations as they are intended to be and some don't. So the consistency is a key. What we always do, it's a real world example and I really, this happened to me at an airport. Um, if you have a credit card, you, you would think it's a very well defined thing. But now look at how many implementations there are at a single cashier and I just wanted to pay a coffee and we had to figure out which of these machines would accept that credit card. So there's a very good definition, but everyone implemented it somehow in their way. Of course, the credit card fit everywhere. That standard was good, but why do I have to have eight different machines to read that credit card? And this is like what we also see in our standards uh, sometimes. Um, we want to create strong standards. And this means we want to have a good definition and we want to have implementations by everyone in, in the same way. And usually when a standard comes out, and many of the standards I'm talking about, they are pretty new, like a couple years old only, and people need to implement them. If you want to make them strong, we have to make sure that each tool provider is implementing around the same core, not everyone starting at a different corner of the standard. And when it becomes established, then the coverage of the standard grows over time. So this means everyone is almost 100% compliant with the standard definition. This is what we want to achieve. What we do not want to achieve is to create weak standards that tool vendor A is implementing this part of the standard, tool vendor B is implementing that part of the standard, and the overlap is so little that if a customer has a database, for example, they, they cannot go to different tool vendors because it was created with the tool of vendor A and because they only did a subset of the entire standard and then it, it's not usable with vendor B. And this, but this is something we are really facing today and also uh, every, every tool vendor in the simulation business is facing this currently. So we want to avoid the right side and we want to have the left side. Um, how, how do we want to do it and, and what's, what's the value? Um, Again, this, this picture, we want to make sure that every data creator using any tool can go to any data consumer using also any of these tools. We want to create with our standards independent marketplaces. We want to, but we need to make sure uh, that we can measure how um, compliant someone is with a defined standard so that you as a player in the market, you can see, okay, this tool vendor implemented that part of the standard, this implemented that part of the standard, and I know it's compatible or not. 
um, and we need to provide reliable references. I'm talking here a little bit about the domain shift of ASM because we have not so far ever uh, provided tooling uh, around our standards, but we are starting this now. So the first one means uh, tool and vendor independence. That's, that's a clear, we are opening a market. That's a clear advantage. Everything gets a, a realistic price. If we have independent marketplaces, you can choose uh, which, which data you, you, you want to take. If we have quantifiable uh, standard uh, compliance, you have reliability. And if we have reliable references, you have a rock solid reference you can use and, and to use with your vendors. What I'm trying to show here is we are currently concentrating at ASAM at the bottom part. We want to make sure that uh, we have reference implementations for our standards, which we have not had yet. And uh, we want to make sure we provide you with tooling to uh, quantify how compliant someone is with the standard. So there are examples that independent marketplaces are already coming, coming up. For example, for open scenario, you have like Safety Pool, which is in, in Great Britain. You have Sakura, which is in, uh, in Japan, and so on. So this is working already. And reliable references are already there. Also, ES Mini is an implementation, for example, for open scenario. And uh, we are on a good way, but we need to get much more professional in this. Um, so standards are good, but if you can quantify the quality of an implementation of a standard, it's even better. Um, we have already done some of these things at, at ASAM before. This is when we bring engineers together to say, okay, here's a server providing this data format. Just plug in your computers and see whether you can read it. And there's a good reason why the results have not yet been published. Um, so that's, uh, that's one thing. But we are taking care at ASAM that we make sure that uh, standard implementation is, is good. Um, a few more slides. We, we also heard uh, today already about the software-defined vehicle, which is uh, kind of a buzzword, but this is where, where it's going. Hardware is becoming a commodity. Software is implementing the functionality. Um, but this is something that's currently really hard to tackle in terms of standards because everyone has a different layout. So if you look at different uh, players in the market, Sophie, Autosar, and whoever it may be, um, everyone is defining the software the vehicle a little bit different along their stack. So we need to figure out how the standards will fit into this, and we need to define the position of ASAM in this. If you have any inputs to the subject, feel free to approach me. Um, maybe you have yet another uh, architecture that might be good um, and uh, yeah where the interfaces need to be standardized and this is uh, one, one of the last things I want to talk about a little is it's the homologation um, and we were talking about ODDs so if you want to test your uh, well you the, the thing is ultimately you need to add up uh, end up on a, on a test track with your uh, with your tests. So you have a test track operator who has a digital twin and a real world track and who has a featured operational domain. You have an OEM who has a target ODD. You have someone doing the test and execution and you have the uh, homologation requirements from the authorities. There is an association which I want to point you to, which is IAMTS. They want to make sure they set up certification criteria for test tracks so that a featured operational domain becomes a certified operational domain. And with the certified operational domain, the OEM can come and say, okay, this part of my ODD, I can test on a certified track. So I had a certified testable operational de design domain. And then my test results will hopefully be accepted by the authorities for the homologation. It's a complex slide. It can get even more complex. Um, this is where ASAM fits in. I will be happy to discuss this with you in further detail. I have an even more complicated uh, version of this if you want to. Uh, but it's a very interesting thing that's going to be driven. Uh, the buzzword here is cyber physical testing and how we can test on certified operational domains in test tracks. Conclusion, um, why ASAM? I got eight seconds left, that won't fit. Okay, um, the thing is there's no standard answer to all of the questions we have here, but it's clear that standards are the key to the answer, today as well as tomorrow. And with that, if you need more information about and from ASOM, uh, there's many means. I think we distribute the slides and then uh, everyone can scan the uh, codes by themselves. That's my last slide. Thanks a lot for your attention. <laughs>